So to get this uni board going, I need a power supply, which I have here. But I also want to connect a monitor to it. I need a monitor to connect to this port here. Just a simple video interface. And rather than drag in a great big 40 inch TV and how awkward that would be, I remembered I had this little cutie, which is a, a five inch black and white television with an actual CRT. And it uh, only weighs about a kilo and a half. It's quite cute. But I thought it was broken. Anyway, but I, however, I decided to uh, try it anyway. I found a suitable power supply and plugged it in. And we've got a raster. Now, does that mean that the television can work as a monitor? Well, to test that, I grabbed an old set top box. And we'll plug that in. Oh, look at that. It talks. Yeah, so it does stuff. So at least as a start, this will do to check out the uniboard. I still want a proper monitor-like screen, you know, 12 or 15 inches flat panel and colour because I have another 6809 base computer that will need colour and there's no prizes for guessing what that is but uh, just to see that this thing works this will do the job so here we are almost at the moment of truth I've installed the two missing chips connected video to the cute little television over there connected power to this ATX power supply and checked out the 1797 versus 1793 floppy disk controller issue. The only difference between the two, looking at the data sheet, is that pin 25 has different functions. And pin 25, according to the schematic, is not connected to anything. And looking at the circuit board, it appears that there is no connection to pin 25. So it shouldn't really matter whether it's a 1797 or a 1793. Now, when I turn this on, I should expect to see... Just a question mark. That's the monitor prompt. That's all that should appear. First I'll turn on the televis. We'll get the raster display. There we go. And now for the moment of truth, look out for sparks. Turn on the power. Wow. Isn't that fascinating? <laughs> Nothing. Right, I've got to check a few voltages and the See if anything's getting hot. Back soon. Okay, so time to get the oscilloscope out. Just checking voltages first. So power on again. That's set at 5 volts per division. So ground, 0, plus 5 volts. Here we go. Minus 12 and plus 12. Now I'm not using the uh, ground lead because there's no good place to connect it and just using the ground through the oscilloscope and the power supply which is good enough for just doing a few basic checks. Next thing to do is look at the uh, clock signals now, now there's a there's the main crystal 32 megahertz and a 7.4 SA4 clock generator and the signals I get out of that are pretty weak but I think that's the bandwidth of the, of the probe. Uh, if I go to the actual processor where it's been divided down to 1 megahertz and look at the signals going into pins 34 and 35 which are e, e in and Q in I believe 40, 39, 38, 37, 36, 35 and got a 2 volts per division and we've got a bit of ringing and carrying on but that's just because I haven't got the ground set and the other one is so yeah 1 megahertz, which is what it's supposed to be, so they're probably pretty good. Now, so then I started probing around elsewhere on the CPU, and pin 1 is ground, and that's supposed to be. And pin 3, I'm sorry, pin 2 is high, that's non maskable interrupt, that's correct. Pin 3 is interrupt, and it's low, something wrong there maybe. And pin 4, fast interrupt, it's low. 
Now that's very curious because if we look at the schematic, the paper schematic is pretty hard to read, but I've got this on the PC. I hope that is visible. Uh, if we look at that's the oscillator I was just looking at there, and it goes through all this divider stuff, and the signals come back in there 34 and 35. E in and Q in, we were looking at those, that was the 1 megahertz. And NMI is plus 5 volts, as it should be. IRQ is pulled up to plus 5, but it was low, so something is pulling it low. And FIRQ, fast interrupt, should be plus 5 volts. Because this board only uses, the only interrupt it uses is IRQ, the other two are supposed to be tied high. But why is FIRQ low when it should be connected to plus 5 volts? most curious. So looking at the board from the underside turn this off. on the underside we notice that pin 4 of the processor there some ingenious head has put a wire over to the expansion connector. Now the first eight pins of that are not connected or they look like they're grounded or something. Ground? No. Yeah, it may be ground. Uh, but this this pin here, which is pin one, I th no pin two, I think, has been cut away, and FIRQ goes to that. But there is no pull up, so maybe that's why it's low. Maybe if I put a pull up on a 2.2k resistor from that to plus five, uh, that'll get rid of the FIRQ. Still don't know about the normal interrupt. And there was no hot chips. The, these this row of RAM chips were getting fairly warm, and after poking around for a while, having it on for a while, they were actually getting very hot, too hot. And even the processor was getting hot. So let's just try tying that FIRQ up to 2. Point, uh, via 2.2K to 5 volts and see if we get any different behaviour. Okay, I've put 2.2K from the FIRQ input to plus 5 volts. That obviously was something I thought was a good idea at the time. This one here, this bodge, is actually a proper errata from the manual. Uh, plus 12 volts needs to be connected to this pot. Even though on the schematic it says to go to plus 5 volts, not plus 12, but the manual, the errata says to connect it to pin 40 of him, which is plus 12. And another errata was pin 15 of U22 is connected to plus 5 volts and shouldn't be. It doesn't stop it working, they say, it just makes it run a little warm. So either cut the trace on the socket or bend the pin out of Now, I can't see if I did cut the trace on the socket. So just to place, play it on the safe side, I'll uh, bend the pin out as well. So now let's see if we get any sort of a different behaviour. With the 2.2K connected to the FIRQ, we'll now turn on the power. Ooh, different. That's encouraging. Play the vertical hold. Well, it seemed to do something for a little while, and then it didn't. Turn it off again. There's something busted. That's better. Now, there's no horizontal hold adjustment, just the... Ah! Now that looks like something coming out of a character generator, doesn't it? Out of a video display. Very stable, but silly. Reset doesn't do anything. You'd think it might. Ooh. Something dodgy there. Now these, all these old sockets are, they're all a bit corroded looking, so there's lots of opportunity for that to cause problems. Process is getting warm again. Now the RAM isn't just, uh, where is it? Yeah, the RAM's getting warm too. Reset button, did something. Yeah, press reset. Hmm, getting closer. Try and find something sensitive. I'm just, bang, I'm just pressing chips all over the board to see if there's a physical sensitivity somewhere. It's 
switch 2 selects whether we use the keyboard or the serial interface as a console input. Try that. Doesn't seem to make any difference whether we have. Hmm. Where do we go from here? So I suppose I need to look at RAM stuff because part of this RAM is what's displayed on the video. 80 by 25, I think there is. Uh, so, yeah, this is displaying what it's reading from the RAM. Now, if there's a problem with the RAM, then obviously we'll get gibberish. If the CRT is not, controller isn't working, we'll get gibberish. If the character generator ROM's not working, we'll get gibberish. Have to look at the RAS and CAS lines. There's a timing diagram for those. The row address select and the column address select lines that go into the RAM for doing the refresh etc. We'll see how they look compared to the timing diagrams given in the manual. So what we should be seeing there is a blank screen with just a question mark prompt and we're not getting it so what could be wrong? I'm worried about these two guys here, these PAL chips. If they've gone bad, bleh. Um, so I think what I might do is, and I should do this anyway, is uh, get out an Arduino and plug those into a breadboard and connect it to the Arduino and try and read out its behaviour and, and store it for posterity and see if it makes any sense according to the signals that it's wired into. Sh should do that anyway, just in case they ever do go bad if they haven't already. Before I do that, there's this timing diagram. I'll just verify that that's the only ti timing diagram I've got. In particular, the RAS and CAS signals for the dynamic RAM will be interesting to see if, if they're right, because that might explain the gibberish we're seeing on the screen if, if they're wrong. But the, the RAS comes out of all the clock generating circuitry. The CAS comes out of one of those PALs. So it'd be nice to see that the CAS looks correct, because that might indicate that the PALs are probably OK, or at least one of them. Now, looking at these signals, they do seem to be around about right. I'll just show you a couple of them, the, the RAS and the CAS. Uh, that's the E signal up there on the oscilloscope, this, this one here. And uh, column address, sorry, RAS is on... So RAS, that's the white, is going... It goes high and then low, straddling the rising edge of E. So that's correct. And it's nice and solid. If you look at the CAS signals, they're in about the right place too, in the second half of the low part of the E cycle. Yeah, E cycle, second half is when CAS goes low. Now, you can see that there's some flickering, so it's not always, it's not solid, I don't know if it should be. There's another one, and Another one, okay, so it looks like two of them are up there. They were there last time I looked, but they were very intermittent. Anyway, uh, turn this off. While, while fiddling around, looking at things, I still haven't tried to read out the contents of those two PALs, but this resistor pack, I was just trying to re see how well it was sitting, making sure there was no bent pins, and I noticed that one of the pins is missing. That little stub doesn't appear to be making electrical contact because I can check that pin over there on that wire. That wire goes to this pin and there's no contact. So I should do something about that. And the whole reason I've got these, I believe, is because I couldn't find any resistor packs at the time I made the kit. So, but I've just gone to my local supplier. They, you know, these things, depending where you look at them, in the documentation, they're either 10 ohms or 33 ohms. The circuit says 10 ohms, but the parts list says 33. These these signals go. These resistors are going into the RAM array, and other resistors go into the RAM array, like these guys. The parts list says anything from 10 to 33 is okay. Now the only the best the closest resistor pack I could get from this my local supplier was 39 ohms. So I'm hoping. Maybe that will be good enough, and I'm hoping that that missing pin there was causing all the trouble. So I'll stick in my new resistor packs. I can get some proper ones from DigiKey ultimately. 
or I can make some using um, machine sockets and soldering resistors, sort of a, a new version of these. But uh, I'll just try the resistor packs that I bought first. So there's our two new resistor packs, and let's have a look at the televis. Turn him on. If the gods are smiling upon me, we'll get a blank screen with a question mark. So turn on the power now. No gods. I was pretty sure about that anyway. Also, I've noticed a number of parts getting hot that I wouldn't have expected. As I mentioned, uh, these RAM chips, particularly that row, gets quite hot. So too does the processor and the CRT controller. But there's no jumping around flashing stuff going on anymore. And is that because these 39 ohms are just too much? When I press reset, nothing happens. All right, so maybe I'll put the one back that wasn't broken and see. What... We'll try it in this position, in the position of the broken one, see what happens. Pretty much the same nonsense. I wonder what happens if there's no resistor packs. All right, so this is with both resistor packs removed. Mm. Okay, that's different. It's, it's the same all over. So those resistor packs must have been doing something. All right, I'll put them back. All right, power on again with the 39K resistor packs installed again. And see, that's not all the same character. So they were doing something, but no response on the reset signal. Now, I'll just leave it run for a little while and see if that excess heat that was coming before from a few of the chips, if that still continues. Maybe that signal was causing a bus conflict. I think the right enable signal goes through one of those resistors, so there's a possibility there. While we're waiting for that to warm up, if you look at the schematic, there's the CAS resistors over there coming out of the one of the PALs. The RAS resistors are here. And I found out what that minus 5 volts is for. It goes into the RAM array. Minus 5 as well as plus 12. So these RAM chips use plus 5, plus 12 and minus 5. And two of the res resistor packs are here. See they say 10 ohm there but the, the um, parts list says 33 ohms. And so RP2 and there's seven lines going through those. Four and three. And these two resistors here are also part of the resistor packs, RP2 and RP3. And therefore right enable and one of the RAS lines. So not sure which one was broken. But the missing pin was on one of these packs here. And there's no pin number, so I don't know which actual address line or do yeah, address line was um, not getting through. But replacing the resistor packs doesn't seem to have done anything for us except the display doesn't wobble around as much, flicker around as much as it used to. But she's still not working. And I can feel the 6089 is still getting warm. CRT controller doesn't, doesn't seem as warm. Well, maybe here it is. There's a few chips uh, warmer than I'd expect. Alright, so these RAM chips were getting hot so I done some playing around and I noticed the one there was getting too hot to touch. They're all a bit warm but that one was getting too hot to touch so I swapped it with the chip that was here and this one got too hot to touch, the same chip and now it's that chip there and if I turn on the power uh, these things haven't proved to be much help. They show similar temperatures for all of them mind you the ambient temperature it's a warm day hot humid rainy day it's 26 25 uh, inside um, yeah, this 34 37 but these ones are warm but this one 
is too hot to leave my finger there. It's, 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 I've got to take my finger off, it's too hot. So I'm pretty convinced that that chip is a dud. So if I swap it out for one of the others, which I'll do now. Okay, power's back on, I've changed this chip over and it doesn't feel hot. I'll give it another minute or so. When, when I had the hot one in there, I also thought that the processor and the CRT controller were getting hotter than usual as well. I mean, they run a bit, a bit warm. They're, they're only a little bit of warmth there now, but yeah, it's everything is cooler. That chip is not getting hot anymore, and these are running cooler than they were. It's, it, but it's very hard to tell. First of all, these things are giving me silly numbers. If I put my hand there. It feels like there's a lot of heat underneath the RAM and from the processor, yet when I use my fingertip, only slightly warm. So it's very hard to tell just with your fingers. That's why I tried to use these things, but they're not helping either. I wish I had one of those blur cameras, but too expensive for me. Right, so the RAM is suspect. You would think, looking at the memory map, We've got the monitor ROM lives at F1000. Then we've got the memory mapped I.O. in the E1000 range. And then the RAM that's used by the monitor is the video display, the stack and monitor variables, all starting at E1000. So the top 8K is all should be needed. So you would think that if I just have this row here of 16K, that would be all that's necessary. But it's more complex than that. I have to actually have the top 32K in there. And that's because of the way that the display RAM works. This is a redrawing of the schematic in the area of the RAM. What's going on is we've got the processor and the CRT controller both putting out the address lines and you can see this is on minus E, that, that, those drive, uh, yeah, Th these are multiplexes, so they take either the seven low bits or the seven high bits and multiplex them onto these seven bits that go through the resistor packs to the RAM. So, so that, that's what CAS and RAS are all about, selecting either this group and then that group, and it has to be done on every access. It has to first set up the, seven bits of, of address and then the other seven bits of address making 14 that go into the RAM. They're activated by E minus, one half of the one megahertz phase clock. If we look here, there's E and E minus. So they're running at one megahertz in their opposite phase. So during one half cycle of the cycle, the processor is, is putting its address onto the RAM and in the other half, the CRT controller which runs off plus E is putting its address into the RAM. But the thing with this guy is when he puts his address there and, and the RAM is red it, it gets locked into these two latches which then go into the character generator. One half is driven by E, the other half is driven by E minus. So the CRT controller is actually reading 16 bits at a time. So it puts the address there and grabs one byte into there from either there or there and this latch grabs a byte from either here or here and then on the on the opposite cycle when the processor is then having a turn at grabbing the bus grabbing the RAM uh, it outputs the other eight bits to the character generator. If I explain that well I'll try again. The processor and CRT controller are interleaving their access to the RAM. The processor grabs eight bytes sorry one byte at a time to go back to the processor. The CRT controller grabs two bytes and so the, the, the memory is arranged in two banks. Uh, so both bytes get latched by E and they're read out on E and E minus. So uh, while, while the CRT controller is grabbing one byte it's displaying that character. When the processor is having its turn at grabbing a byte the character generators displaying the other byte of the two that were read on the previous cycle. Does that make sense? Anyway, the upshot of it all is we have to have both these banks installed for 
the character generator to work. So that's why I've got two rows there. And we're still getting gibberish on the display. So given that that, that one chip is getting very hot, given that we've got gibberish on the display, I'm extremely suspicious of the RAM not working. And uh, this, this reminds me of back in the day when I first started playing this stuff, back in the 70s. There was, there was a joke going around about the difference between dynamic RAM and static RAM. This is dynamic RAM. Uh, static RAM's basically a bunch of flip-flops, whereas this is a bunch of capacitors. The, the, the joke went, the difference between static RAM and dynamic RAM is that static RAM works. And although it was a joke, there's a lot of truth to it. It was very hard to get dynamic RAM working for hobbyists back in those days. So static RAM was very popular on the first homebrew PCs. Uh, but they obviously figured they'd got it sorted well enough to use it, to use dynamic RAM on this board. Because in those days, um, the amount of chips you need for static RAM for 64K was a lot more than 32 like that. Yeah. Nothing's getting extremely hot anymore with that chip swapped out. All right, turn that off. So we suspect the RAM. Now, something else that lends weight to the idea of the RAM being faulty is this. This here is my attempt at an emulator for this uni board. I've got, got a fair way of it, but uh, here's the simulated serial monitor, the simulated video display, and here's the emulator. Now, if I, we're not interested in the keyboard, so I'll hide that. And this was written for a desktop where I had a bit more screen space than on this bloody laptop. If I just run it, see, it generated the command prompt on the serial port. But I'm interested in the video display RAM, so I'll close that off, reset the thing, change the sense switch so that it, it now uses the keyboard and video instead of the serial port to communicate, and run it again. And you see it's clearing the screen. And then at that point I, I don't get much, I don't get as far as, it doesn't produce the, the command prompt um, emulator, doesn't work so well beyond that. But the interesting thing is this. Now, if we look at uh, the end of memory, end of the ROM, the reset vector goes to a label called warm ST, warm start which I think is wrong, which probably should be called cold start, because, and I'm not sure what's going on, because that's where it runs, that's where it goes to. That's the first thing that runs. Here's the trace of the execution. It loads two stack pointers, and then calls this routine CRTC init, which is CRT controller initialization. If we go into that, it's running this code here. There's two loops here. The first loop, copies this block of constants into the registers of the CRT controller. And these constants are things like number of characters per line, timing of the horizontal and vertical sync signals, etc. So it loads them to the CRT controller. Then this, this second loop loads this block of constants into an area in RAM. And that's things like the display RAM address, the current cursor position, etc. And then it returns to the calling routine there. Now the interesting thing about this is that up until this point here, this is the first time that it actually needs the RAM to be working, that, that it needs to read back something that it's read into the, that it's written into the RAM. In this case, it's the return address, so it knows where to go back to continue with the initialization. And, and down here is where it issues a form feed character, hex zero C, and that's implemented by just filling the display RAM with uh, spaces. That happens further down. But if the RAM's not working, it'll never get back here. It'll just go to this routine, load the parameters into the CRT controller, try and store this stuff into RAM, whether it's getting in there or not, we don't know, but if it can't read that return address, this is where things go off the rails. And given that the display is basically right. It, it seems to have set the timing and the number of characters per line, etc. It's just that what it's displaying is gibberish, but the, the formatting appears correct. So it's exactly as if it has run this loop to load these parameters to the CRT controller and then went off the rails. And when the CRT controller accesses the RAM, if the RAM is not working, as I suspect, then you'll get gibberish on the screen, which is what we get. So uh, what I believe is going on is bad RAM. 
or something wrong with the RAM system. So the signals that control the RAM are the E and E minus, this MUX signal which selects uh, whether it's going to pull in that half, the, those seven bits or these seven bits, or in the case of the CRT controller, those seven or these seven, and put them onto the 14 bit address bus, sorry, the seven bit address bus into the RAMs. And, it, and of course it needs also to be synchronised with the RAS and CAS signals that tell it to latch this seven, then that seven, look up the memory, put the result onto the bus, the output bus here, and more signals control that getting back to the processor or into the CRT generator, uh, the character generator. So, so those signals are critical. Um, e and E minus are pretty straightforward and, and they're right. The MUX signal is, if you look at the schematic, this MUX signal is here and I can't find it anywhere on this diagram. It, it's used, it also goes into here somewhere, one of those, but I can't see where it's coming from. And I had to actually trace it out on the board and it turns out it's coming out of this ring counter here, the third bit in that ring counter. And the RAS and CAS signals, which are also critical of course, come from those two PALs. The RASs just come out of that ring counter also, so they're all, they're all driven at the same time, but the CAS signals are needed to um, select which particular bank of chips is to be talked to. You, you'd suspect maybe the PAL could be wrong, but uh, and I have since read out the PALs, and I'll do a video about those because it's an interesting project just in itself, but I'm fairly certain that the PALs are good. So I have to look at the something else to do with the RAM. So it could be any of these support chips being wonky. So probably the next thing to do is to, where, wherever possible, swap out these chips to see if a, a fault can be found that way. Yeah, but because of that uh, dual byte access for the CRT controller, that's why I have to have two banks in there. And, and the data is probably spread across both chips. It's not as if that's the top 8K, and this is the next 8K, so, sorry, 16K. The top 8K is probably spread, spread between both banks, and the next 8K is spread between the, both banks, and the next 8K, and so on. The next thing to do, I'm pretty confident the PAL chips are good. Wherever possible, wherever I can find replacement chips, I'm just going to start swapping out anything to do around the RAM and see if, see if the fault goes away. Uh, the, the other thing to chase up, of course, was the interrupt line to the process of being low when it shouldn't be. At, at this point, the, nothing should be causing interrupts, so the line shouldn't be low. So that, that's the next thing to check out. Because when it's just sitting there waiting for a keyboard input, there should be no interrupts happening. So if we look at that, FR, that IRQ line, which is pulled up by that resistor, and follow it around, we see the serial interface chip goes to it. I pulled that out. The line was still low, so that's back. Uh, the parallel interface adapter, IRQ, that also goes to it, took him out. Still, the interrupt line was low. It also goes down here, which we'll investigate in a second, but I'll just show you also the DMA controller, IRQ goes, it uses an IRQ, I took that out. The line was still low and over here, the floppy disk controller, his interrupt line goes through a hex inverter to the IRQ bus. So I took him out and no difference. It was still low. So I put, put those chips all back in. So U9 is one of the things that drives the IRQ. And if we follow that other bus down here, we see IRQ is also driven from U9. And I took out U9 and it went high. I'll leave U9 out for the moment, worry about why that was happening at some other time. This is high, so that'll be low, so this will be high. This could be again be my expansion connector mucking around that has caused the problems, but I'll worry about that later. I don't care about any interrupts right now, I just want to get a prompt. Right, so the DMA controller's back in, the parallel interface adapter's back in, the serial interface is back in. I've left out the floppy disk controller and this is that U9 that was 
uh, pulling the interrupt line down. So now it's high, and when we turn it on, we still get gibberish on the screen. So finally, yes, um, the taking this chip out got rid of the interrupt problem. We had a bad RAM chip, certainly. It got getting way too hot. Uh, but there's still something wrong in the RAM region, I'm pretty convinced. And so I'm going to start swapping chips around, but leave it at that for now, because this video is already pretty long. The next one will be about reading the PALs, and then we'll hopefully have another one where I've found the problem with the RAM. So I uh, hope you've enjoyed. To be continued, and catch you later.